Thank you so much, Christina. And um, it's great to be here uh, with the gathered class in person. Um, I wish I were there with you in person, but it's nice because I see my parents are here and one of my brothers is here. So it's like a whole family, professional, personal affair, um, which is which is lovely, make, made possible by Zoom. I just wanna alert people that um, closed captioning is enabled. This is uh, the AI for this is getting better all the time. So if you wanna do that, look at, click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen uh, and you will uh, see that technology in action. Um, so I'm, I'm so pleased to be here, especially uh, with the products of design group. I mean, when I read about this department at SVA, I knew immediately I was kind of among my people because it is the products of design. That is not to say designed products, right? With a kind of foregone conclusion about what design produces. And so you'll see today that in my own practice that the products of design have been in this kind of prismatic way some thinking work, some making work, some writing, some prototyping together, some gathering, you know, that happens uh, as a result of design. So I know that plenty of you in graduate school are thinking about building your own bodies of work and what is it, what are those products, what is the production that you want to result from all your thinking and your making. So I hope we can talk about that irrespective even of the topic of disability today, if it's on your minds, it's something I like to uh, speak a lot about with students. So I will now go and uh, share my screen and uh, then we'll come back together at the end to discuss what what uh, ideas and questions you might have. So here we are, um, you know, I'm showing you a whole collection of objects um, that you might think of very broadly as disability things. We'll talk a little bit today about all the stuff and the material culture of disability, but when I had you in my mind side today um, and this week, I've been thinking about this idea of collecting and in a number of different ways. That is, right, what are these products of design when we think of design and disability? Um, I'm coming to you today, as I mentioned, with multiple roles um, in, in hand. So I do some thinking and making, some reporting, and I literally mean in the journalistic sense, and some prototyping. And the work I'm interested in in design and disability is both the pragmatic kind and the playful kind. So I'm just trying to demonstrate to you the kind of co wide collection um, of objects and ideas that I hope uh, to, to put before you today. Um, on the left is an image of my book. So that's the kind of reporting and thinking part. And on the right, you, that's an image of me in Seoul in South Korea uh, with a number of kids on uh, little scooters and. Um, in a like ramped dance environment. That's a, a project of mine that I'll tell you a little bit about later. So some words and some objects both. So, but when people think of collecting, right? In your mind's eye, if you're interested in design and disability, typically the kind of collection that comes to your mind's eye is a collection like this. So it tends to be these, what we call, as you know, in design, universally designed objects. So the Cuisinart food processor that was redesigned for home use uh, in the 1970s, the Aeron chair and the OXO Good Grips kitchen tools line. All of those have their origin story, you may know, in disability, in aging in particular, and arthritis. All those work sort of better mousetrap designs, looking closely at the condition of disability to make them more ergonomic, more flexible for use, more friendly to the body. And as you know, the logic goes, you look in those margins of experience and you get actually insight and a better product for a lot of people. And in fact, the disability story kind of fades to the background for better or for worse. And that's what people think of. Okay, this is what disability and design means. They mean universal design or perhaps in addition, that image on the right, which is of a sort of high-end myoelectric replacement arm. So prosthetics is what we think of. You know, the best that technology can buy, this kind of simulacrum of the body, how close can a machine get to replacing the functionality of the body? And that's what we, that's what we collect in our mind's eye. Okay, either universality on the one hand, or this idea of replacement parts. And I wanna just suggest to you that there is a vast, vast collection of other kinds of material objects and ideas that we might collect in our mind's eye to, to widen both the expanse of, of what both these ideas mean and to alert ourselves too, as our bodies move through the world as to where disability shows up in more surprising places. So just as a tiny little example, set of alternate objects that you may not have seen before would include, for example, 
Um, the Oil of Olay Easy Open Jar, that's a brand new design as of last year. You see the little wings there on that cold cream jar. That's again, a kind of ergonomics, you know, very much in the logic of the good grips. But also below that is Zubits, a little magnetic closure that will alter any laced shoe into an easy snap on and off. That's an accidental kind of disability object. It was designed just for people who wanted an easy on and off, um, you know, kind of slip on, slip off transformation of shoes, but now you can find them at the Arthritis Foundation's shop, right? So, so it became a kind of disability application. You might also, if you haven't seen it before, uh, encounter the, the glorious, joyful red ramp that I'm showing you there up on the upper right at the Ed Roberts campus at UC Berkeley, right there in the, the main atrium hall um, of that campus. But you might also uh, not realize, right, that, that on the lower right, Rebecca Horn um, was making these finger gloves, this, this, these very enigmatic objects in her own art practice that was partly born of extended hospital stays she had uh, with uh, some chronic illness. There's a lot of kind of interesting bespoke objects that help us think again about disability and its, its many objects. Um, for a contemporary example counterpart, you might look at Sandy Yi, her Crip Couture, which is these, you know, again, highly enigmatic and bespoke wearable objects that are meant to do something besides scalable universal design or even prosthetic parts, but they are disability and design nonetheless. Or this man here at the bottom of the slide, uh, Chris, who has one arm and he's standing at the changing table with his small child. And he's using a prosthesis that he rigged up himself for a few dollars of just some uh, felted wool uh, string to, to uh, suspend his baby's ankles while he changes uh, his diaper. An object that will never go to mass manufacturing and an object that we'd never think of in our mind's eye when we think about disability and design. But it turns out it really is everywhere. It is an artful practice. Uh, made for the gallery. It is an everyday practical product uh, design practice made for, uh, you know, the big box store. It is at the scale of architecture and streets, and it is happening way out of the public eye in the everyday tinkering that people are doing in their homes every day. So, so that collection, let that collection uh, blossom and flourish. And what I mean then by this is not necessarily universality or, you know, I don't think we have to call it so much prosthetics or assistive technology, so much as tools for assistance writ large. And that I think that this idea can collect each of us in its story. That in other words, um, help, the giving and receiving of help is happening in our material culture all the time. And we might locate ourselves in it and we might therefore um, uh, broaden our imagination for where it might happen as designers next. Um, and again, just, to, just as I've demonstrated in that um, collection before, some of what we think of in design is solving problems. When disability and design meet, I think there are as many questions to be asked in our artifacts and stuff, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, and again, that is a kind of broadening of the scope of what we imagine help is, where it arrives, who gives it, who receives it and so on. Okay, so thinking and making, reporting and prototyping, pragmatic and playful. I wanna just start on the right side in the kind of making and prototyping vein and just tell you a couple of stories of uh, collaborations that I've done as a design researcher. I'm really not a designer in that kind of formal professionalized sense, but more a person who sets up uh, conditions where design uh, comes into being. I'll just tell you one story about a collaboration with a, an artist who you're looking at here, Carmen Papalia. And in these two images, you can see that he's using a white navigational cane, but the cane he's using is absurdly large. And it's kind of a kind of, um, it's meant to, to be a kind of provocation and a, and a humorous object in public. It is of the kind of cane that he could never really use for practical navigation, but he does in fact use one, he is blind. And Carmen would say he has a really kind of complicated relationship to this cane because he would say that the, the ordinary cane he uses brings him all kinds of help in public that he doesn't need and doesn't actually bring him the help that he does need. So he makes all kinds of really interesting work playing with and playing at blindness, navigation, help in public. And it's an extraordinary whole practice. And he has a he has a kind of social practice too, kind of durational and performances. This is a blind field shuttle. So it's a line of people each who've got their eyes closed and are using one hand on a sh the shoulder of the person 
behind to do these kind of sensory tours. This is not a kind of empathy exercise. It's not meant to make you feel what it's like to be Carmen. It's just a different way of being in your body led by uh, this person, Blind Field Shuttle. So Carmen came to campus and he said, look, you know, I, I would like for my cane to do something else than it normally does. For instance, what if my cane actually played music? Like what if it made sound? So this is an image of us uh, at Olin College where I teach um, uh, in the kind of prototyping mode where students were like, well, what can we do? All right, and this is where engineering students and designers really shine, right? Where they go, who has a contact mic? Okay, patch that thing onto the end. And okay, who's got, a, who's got an amp in their dorm room? Run, go get it. You know, we have this tiny little campus. And so we could, they could kind of mock up together like, oh, well, you know, if a microphone is at the end of the cane, it will pick up that, the texture of that fiberboard, for example, which is different from the texture of that carpet. And we could actually make it play a sound. So, you know, he, he together, we sort of prototyped and sketched out what are all the ways that we could do this. And students ended up building for him this with a triple interrupted 3D print um, contact mic at the end of the cane with this kind of boom box that you see sort of old school boom box that's got a bunch of knobs for reverbing the sound and so on and made a kind of acoustic mobility device. That's what Carmen calls it. So here is a kind of prosthesis that is asking you to utterly invert your ideas about who's getting help and what kind. And also what the subjectivity of this artist is trying to broadcast to you about their own expressive life in their own body, their mobility, their navigation. What is happening here? It is, it is, it is utterly, uh, uh, you know, asking you to, to ask your own questions about your preconceived notions of blindness and about blind artistry, your ideas of how you get through space, what a cane is for, could a one tool designed for one thing rearrange its parts and do something else. So this is a tool, a design, a prosthesis, but it is meant for actually asking questions, full stop, raising questions and suspending them without actually an easy resolution. There is no tech savior arriving to this scene. There is no clear problem solving, wash our hands of this issue. There is only enigma, estrangement, expressive uh, poetics at hand in stuff made with engineering. And I want to just emphasize to you, we're just looking again at this prototyping scene, the collecting that's happening here, of course, is yes, the objects, but much more importantly are the relationships that are happening between and among these students and this artist, right? That the collection, this is why the prototyping, the laboratory and the studio are such a powerful arena because they gather people who actually get to know one another in the shared task of, of making a thing together, where they're saying, oh, we are more alike than we are different, but also your experience is distinct from mine, but also I thought disability was only hindrance and diminishment, but in fact, it's creative and resourceful. Think of all the collecting that's happening between and among people in a, an arena of design. So that's like one kind of uh, collaboration that I do in the studio. I'll tell you a slightly longer story about a, um, a, a project that's built around the ramp, the incline plane, it's called slope intercept which is probably the only like math joke I will ever achieve um, in, an art, in an art context. But uh, it is about the ramp as an object. So I'm showing you three images here of a little family of ramps. This was my thesis project at Harvard GSD uh, a decade ago. They are, as you see, uh, like stackable, nestable, uh, kind of three feet by three feet plywood ramps with a big piano hinge at the end. And they're on caster, so they're uh, portable and they have little leveling feet so they could go up and down uh, within about a six inch range. So, I mean, I'm fascinated by simple machines. That is, that is what a ramp is after all, an incline plane. So I'm just showing you, this is Galileo's little suite of very elegant, simple machines that are in our built environment everywhere. The pulley, the lever, the wheel and axle, the wedge, the screw, and the incline plane, which is a machine, even though it's just a shape right? So it's just the magic of physics. It's the, it's the, the transformation of force across a surface that, that on a slope, right? The, the effort is utterly transformed as opposed to the brute force of a step. That's what an incline plane does. And it's so interesting because you have to go to like science for kids websites to even see simple machines anymore. Everybody's just kind of over it, you know, but like, I am not over it. I don't know about you, but like, if you put like 
boxes and books on a dolly and you just tip the dolly, like magically you can transport, you know, like hundreds of pounds of, you know what I mean? Like, that's amazing. And nobody ever talks about it, but like, it's always, it's always in this kind of like K to 12 science. So anyway, I'm, I'm not over it. Maybe some of you are not over it either. And the inclined plane is doing this magic thing. So meanwhile, the inclined plane can do lots of stuff in cities. And I, this design was meant to kind of be a, to force a weird Venn diagram between two kinds of city users. One, of course, is wheelchair users. That's what you're seeing on the right. That, that, that transformation of physics does a powerful, pragmatic daily kind of access. But also to think about another wheeled mobile gear user, and that is a skateboarder who can use ramps and in, indeed find ramps uh, and, and misuse and adaptively reuse surfaces all over the city. And I wanted you to see these two people using this same simple machine precisely to mix those uses, right? A lot of times people think of skateboarding as virtuosic and athletic, and they might think of wheelchair use as a diminished form of walking. But in fact, both of these mobile, uh, mobile gear, you know, kind of extensions of the body can be very playful and can be very pragmatic. And I wanted to see what would happen if, um, if you saw them in the same kind of usage light. And that, and that ramp is over-engineered. You know, I made it with Michael Mewey, who you're looking at here, who was, at the time was the Cambridge Disability Commissioner. It is, it is engineered to take the, the body of a full-grown person in a motorized chair. And there's like sand in, the, in the, uh, the, the finish, you know, to make it grippy on those wheels and all that. So it hues to constraints in design. It meets the code for temporary ramps uh, in the built environment. But it is meant really to be an object to think with, a kind of prototyping object to think with. Um, and to see, again, people uh, in your mind's eye differently, collected by a shared kind of object. It is designed to meet also a gray area in the uh, architectural code of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is the single step entrance. So you'll see this all over New York, uh, Boston, this is London, uh, Toronto, Seoul, lots of cities in the world. Uh, if they've got, a, if you have a mom and pop shop like this and you're not overhauling it in general, then you don't have to create a ramp uh, entrance at the front. And what that means that I, you know, by talking to a lot of my wheelchair using friends here, what that means is that it's a very complaint driven kind of situation, whether there is a temporary ramp available to you and whether you can reach the doorbell to request it and where the ramp is kept in the back and so on. And so uh, this single step entrance is this kind of weird uh, liminal space uh, wherein a temporary ramp, you know, can do some of its work. And so I was thinking about that. This is a, an aerial shot of Cambridge Street in Cambridge, Mass, where I live, and just the, all those little red dots are the preponderance, you know, uh, a dozen and a half of the single step entrance, just on a little stretch of street. So it's quite a lot. And like, what would happen if we were alert to uh, the way that an inclined plane can ch change that environment? So that was kind of the first instantiation of that project. And then a couple of years later, this woman, Alice Shepard, um, who is a wheelchair dancer, you're seeing her here in a kind of ramped environment, she wrote to me and said, like, I hear you're into, into ramps and I'm looking for one, but not one to get into a building. I'd like a ramp for stage because I just wanna use the same physics, right? Acceleration down, resistance as you go up. Um, I wanna make beautiful movement with that. What can we do together? So she came to campus and you can see my little ramps there in the foreground, but my students built kind of medium sized ramps. And then we borrowed some dance tiles from the campus next door and built a kind of prototyping environment for Alice to sort of figure out like how fast did she want to descend, you know, in order to also make the kind of movements that she wanted to, but to feel safe. And this was this whole kind of testing environment. And my students, these are mostly first year engineering students, but we have a very builders kind of campus. So they, they did all this stuff. I mean, their expertise far outpaced mine really quickly on this stuff. So I'm just showing you four images of students, you know, operating the saws and the uh, CNC router and building uh, a, a giant kind of 24 foot big oceanic wave of a ramp um, in an administrative building uh, at Olin over the course of a semester. Here it is, look at that beautiful internal structure there you can see. And Alice came back and uh, and danced on it with us and, and you know, talked to students about uh, um, how this whole thing came to be and what it's like to be in her body. And this is now a professional, uh, you know, stage ramp for installation that you can see via kineticlight.org. They 
you know, did another kind of refined version with like a union managed shop and all that. But this is nonetheless this, that student, that same oceanic wave student design that Alice uh, dances on now. And you should just see, if I were there with you in person, I would just show you the beautiful kind of pendulum, you know, uh, graceful movement that you can make on a ramp in a wheelchair that you can't actually make on two ambulatory feet. The chair makes a very particular thing possible. So when we were in the midst of that prototyping, I was invited by the Seoul Museum of Art to uh, do something with ramps at the Media City Seoul um, Biennial. And we were prototyping with Alice at that time. And I thought, you know, just that kind of prototyping environment um, itself is a really interesting dance space, right? So just that, just that prototyping set of medium scale and my little small scale ramps with dance tiles, I call it a platform kit. Like what, what else could we do with this? And so I invited Alice to come and we installed in the front of that plaza in the Seoul Museum of Arts. So this is a big overhead shot of, of Alice on granite stones uh, and people gathered around watching her on uh, nine dance tiles and four ramps. Um, but we spent several days uh, in Seoul and then on, uh, she performed uh, on this platform kit. But we also did a kind of auditing of the built environment with, uh, with local activists uh, in disability, um, kind of touring the city and seeing conditions there. I visited a school for um, children with developmental disabilities and, and parent advocates there. Um, and then, you know, kind of the most important collecting and encounter that happened was this invitation, you know, this particular invitation to wheelchair users uh, and self advocates with disabilities in Seoul. So, this is just an image of folks talking to Alice, uh, a number of chair users, uh, and others standing around. Uh, at using that ramp stage, but also meeting each other and meeting Alice, right? That, that this kind of collection for me is what's most interesting when, when the, the object or the artifact creates conditions whereby people who might not have encountered one another, in fact, do so. So that's me, that's where I am with the, the youngest wheeled mobile gear users uh, in Seoul with their little uh, scooters also using, this was another site where we installed uh, another platform kit. Um, and we saw um, somebody sent me an after hours shot of um, folks using bikes, you know, in the overnight, like using bikes for for ramped uh, jumps and so on. Uh, and at the end, and for me, this is really where the 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 pragmatic and the playful uh, converge. These my little ramps you see here on the left, um, we donated to nonprofits uh, who uh, are work on disability advocacy in Seoul who also have, you see there, a single step entrance um, at, in, at their shop to, on the right. That's a bunch of folks um, in that disability organizations. For me, that's kind of the, the ideal denouement of the, of the project, right? Where it ends with a very pragmatic provision, a very on the ground, simple machine doing its same work over and over, you know, digital life be damned kind of thing. Like it's like, at, still at the end of the day, a, a simple machine is a really powerful uh, work of access. Okay. So I hope you just see in some of that, that your collection may be in your mind's eye, might see that tools for assistance actually live in lots of places and that the assistance is multi-directional and uh, that it does a lot of things uh, besides universality, a lot of things uh, besides as, you know, fixing bodies and so on, that collecting can be a practice of solving problems and asking questions and that we might build in our mind's eye uh, and imagination for that. So then I'll just briefly mention to you the left side, the reporting side. I've also just spent 10 years talking to people about the designs that they make, uh, disabled people at the heart of redesigning and remaking their worlds. That's in the history of the disability rights movement. It's happening all the time, every day, in formal design ways and in informal modes of expertise. So we drop in, for example, at the Adaptive Design Association, which is there in your neighborhood in New York, uh, building cardboard carpentry, uh, bespoke, radically bespoke furniture uh, out of triple wall cardboard for children all over New York City. So on the left, we're in the workshop itself, and there's a little two-year-old boy there who appears in the book uh, under the pseudonym of Nico, and uh, uh, you know, a, a fabricator and a physical therapist and an educator are looking as closely as they can at this little boy and thinking, down to the quarter of an inch, what is it that he needs for the maximum stability, you know, allowance for his growth and so on. Um, and that's him then in the middle with the finished painted chair and uh, accessories, a little tray that comes off and on 
um, an extension of a table. And I've just got it next to that Aeron chair, right? Which, which does a really interesting and important work in its universality, but what an interesting counterpart we could add to our collection in this you know, design for one over and over and over. And the Adaptive Design Association is never gonna make a single widget that goes to the scale of 100,000 or a million objects. What they do is scale a kind of platform for working. So they, their site has a huge comprehensive video library. They bring in people from all over the world who they train, they travel to, to train and people elsewhere. And they're committed to materials that are mostly in the global supply chain. So triple wall cardboard, you can build out of single wall cardboard, stacking three, but you know, Elmer's glue and wooden dowels and the back of a spoon for scoring and cutting, you know, just like very democratic materials, uh, a, a, an open and democratic space for anybody who has an idea to come in and make a request. And it just, again, it, it confounds, it's what Ezio Manzini calls diffuse design or cosmopolitan localism. So you can, you don't have to think in the 21st century, right, about, again, that sort of the scales of manufacturing that are one object times a gazillion, but one way of working that can be networked and shared. So I think it does an important work for us there collectively, imaginatively. Perhaps some of you have heard of Deaf Space, which is down at Gallaudet University. Um, Gallaudet's an old university, you know, has all kinds of clever adaptations for uh, deaf culture that is not, you know, trying to create the condition of hearing. It's entirely a space that's deaf owned and deaf run and it celebrates and enhances um, the way deaf people speak in their visual language, forms of sociality and so on. So you can see old buildings there and new, this is a new building. So we're in the lobby of a combination dorm and workspace. And you can see that what you need in a uh, visual language environment is like half height walls. So you have really long sight lines. You need uh, the blues and greens that you see here on the walls and the upholstery so that you've got nice contrast for a, a number of skin tones because people are signing to one another. You wouldn't want busy wallpaper or bright white for that. Wood and its resonance for calling a group to order. You, you often use the, um, the qualities of wood to, 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 to deliver sound. Um, and 360 arrangements of furniture, that kind of thing, all really beautiful kind of codified set of principles um, that are uh, architecture for deafness, not architecture to cure deafness. So we'd have to add that to our mind's eye, not a replacement part, you know, a reimagining of space. And down the street in Washington, DC, which I encourage you to visit uh, is the signing Starbucks, which is completely run by deaf and hard of hearing folks behind the counter, but they serve the general public. So it looks just like a regular old, very homogenous generic Starbucks. But as a hearing person, I went into this Starbucks and wrote my name and my order on a wipe away LCD tablet. And then my name came up with my order on a monitor at the end of the coffee bar. So, and the payment was all automated in the way that it is. So I didn't need to be fluent in sign and these people never needed to voice, but we had a very friendly interaction uh, mediated by machines and they weren't even that high tech. I mean, let's be clear that, that LCD tablet, you can just let, you know, it's just not that much. And I, what I find is that in conversations about accessibility, people have to point to this kind of like, very expensive, super engineered, DARPA level, you know, like how are we ever going to adapt? And you think like, actually, you know, like a couple of little service design moves and the whole thing changes here. Who owns that space? Who gets to be there? Who they serve? And so there's a, a bank and a pizza parlor, I think also in, uh, in the works with this same kind of model. I would also point you to Steve Sailing, who you're looking at here uh, in his, his, his residence here in Chelsea, uh, in Boston, Mass., and Steve, as you see, has advanced ALS. He he's 12, 13 years into his diagnosis, is trained as a landscape designer. So when he got his diagnosis of ALS, he set to work immediately on designing a space uh, that would anticipate the changes that were coming to his body. And this is, you know, before the era of kind of smart home tech came to um, kind of ubiquitous availability. So he had to go and kind of link together philanthropist, nursing home director, software folks, and so what you can't see is that Steve has a little cursor that's on the nose bridge of his glasses that's talking to the tablet on his that's mounted on his motorized wheelchair. And with that cursor speaking <clears throat> to that tablet, he can both type to play his thoughts, you know, uh, to be spoken by a computer speaker, but he can also um, call all the elevators and he can raise and lower the blinds and open all the doors in the space. So this is like a his private room 
in a shared floor uh, of a nursing home that houses Steve and a dozen other people with ALS or with MS in this very automated environment. So the ALS Residence Initiative is this, uh, yeah, technologically supported form of, of independence insofar as one can preserve it. And people there are using all kinds of like mouth sticks for their iPad tablets and really creative kinds of technologies. But more importantly, that Steve set out to build a life worth living and to claim it as such, right? And that, that I think changes the conversation about, about uh, a worthy life and about a life with dependence in it. That's what I mean about tools for assistance. That Steve could see that assistance would be part of a rich ecosystem of care and that he decided to, to, to enjoin himself to it. I mean, I just never get over how profound that is. And finally, the, um, the Dementia Village, um, De Hoogweg, which is in Vaisp in the Netherlands, you may have, I mean, architecture for dementia is a huge burgeoning area. And this is a locked facility. You know, you go through two sets of doors and it opens up onto a plaza with a grocery store and a bar and a restaurant and a barbershop and a gym and the whole deal. And this was, you know, the, the thinking of people who, I mean, the design wasn't first, you know, they sort of set about to say, if we were to get a board of this nursing home sat down to say like if we were to get dementia is this place this long this nursing home right with a long bay of rooms and the nursing site in the middle standard kind of clinical care is this where we'd want to live you know and the question was a resounding no so they thought okay well what are our principles then and one of them was favorable surroundings and what they meant by that was the kind of continuity with ordinary pre-diagnostic life. So what could we preserve about everyday life in uh, this, what is a clinical you know, uh, site for care? And that was this kind of highly placeful, placeful, right? Not these multi-purpose rooms, not these generic kind of hospital environments, but this very locally colorful, grounded kind of work. And I think the most genius thing here is that the restaurant on campus is semi-private, semi-public. So you do have to go through those locked doors and keep it secure, but you can, as a, as a resident of the town, have lunch at the restaurant just on a Tuesday. But you just have an agreement tacitly, you and the wait staff and so on there, you know that there are going to be people wandering in. There are going to be residents wandering in who may be confused. And everybody there just agrees to have a kind of human and humane uh, set of interactions with people. And it just means that the residents who lived here are not fully locked away from the public eye. There is this kind of porous architecture um, whereby, and I just think that is so, uh, so smart. So, right, what does it mean to hold up a practice like Carmen's, the acoustic mobility device, right alongside the collecting in your mind's eye, right alongside cardboard carpentry, you know, for a two-year-old with a rare genetic condition? What does it mean to be both playful and pragmatic in some of the most meaningful conditions of assistance of our lives? Could we hold those things together? What does it mean for Alice to ask for a ramp for beauty and for asking questions and for Steve to set about solving problems in the way that he would? You know, he on the terrace that Scott Grass, you know, on you know, right outside his main residence door there's like a rubber layer to protect you know the grass from getting caught up in the wheelchair wheels I mean the most kind of pragmatic detailed decisions can we hold and collect in our mind's eye this will to ask questions about the human experience of assistance so a lot of times in design people talk about right wicked problems they want to say meaning and I understand what it means it means problems that, that, right, that surpass any one scale of design, problems that are not merely technological, they're sociopolitical and so on. But I just wanna offer as, as an alternative, what does it mean to have a, a fortified set of questions? That's, you know, that's Spinoza's question that is the title of my book. What can a body do? Okay, what is a body wanting for, wishing for? Where are its pleasures? Where are its needs? And would we know as designers where to drop in you know, at the service level of the signing Starbucks, at the little Zubitz magnetic closure for the, for the shoe, you know, a contact mic at the end of the cane, a ramp for dancing. Would we know? We would know if we fortify our questions and that is a quality of attention and of will. 
And finally, I'll just revisit uh, this big question to each of you today, no matter what your embodiment, can an idea in disability collect you? And that is, you're looking at uh, my husband and me and, and my the eldest of my three children. So he's, uh, his name is Graham, he's 16 now, he has Down syndrome. And this is the kind of material culture that collected us there on the left. So his little tiny orthotic uh, shoe, you know, braces and all the many glasses uh, that he's worn since he was 11 months old, a baby with glasses. <laughs> and the collecting of us, right, that happened, you know, so we, we're now in an ecosystem of giving and receiving of assistance. And I do mean everybody giving and receiving that will last our whole lives, right? And you all too, maybe you get some help now. Maybe you give help now. Your parents, your siblings, your loved ones. You'll also be on the receiving end if you're not already of that help. Can you see help actually in a, in a good life? Can you see it in a desirable future? Can you let disability collect you as well? Can we make tools for assistance, making and thinking as our products of design? And most of all, can we design a future with help in it, not designed out of it? So thanks for your attention. I'm gonna stop sharing and see what is on your minds. Thank you, I see you're clapping. I think Zoom scrubs out all the, that noise. I wish I could be in the room with you, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we can clap again with the with the mic on. <laughs> and Zoom again goes like, no. <laughs> there we go. Sound. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. That was a really beautiful lecture, super insightful. Um, so we will open it now to the students for a QA. Um, and if you want to leave uh, questions in the chat, I can monitor that as well. We'll take questions in person first. Um, we have a microphone set up here in the front. So if anyone wants to ask Sarah a question, please uh, go right ahead. Thanks, Monica. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Sarah? Okay, now I can, I heard that last question. Awesome. Um, my name is Monica, and I'm really excited because I read your book last summer, and it really resonated with me in lots of ways. Um, I, like you, have a background in art. Um, I have been a ceramicist for many years and also a dancer. So your book, even though I had never, like, ever really thought about disability, it hit me in this, like, kind of place of comfort. Like, I knew what you were talking about, even though I never really thought it. Um, so, so thank you so much for, for that piece of writing. Um, I think my question to you is, if we don't wanna think about disability as something that everybody has, right? If we don't wanna take disability as a victimization, right? Because that's not helpful. And also not fair for the bodies that, the bodies that are, that society um, kind of puts at a, at a disability, right? Um, and also because maybe our bodies don't suffer as much as other bodies. Yes. How can we reconcile this idea that we don't fit in without yeah. it being this like, oh, I'm wounded and like, I'm helpless. Yeah, just um, the last thing you said, Monica, there, without it being, can you say that slowly? Uh, without it, uh, it being interpreted internally as, as, um, as woundedness or helplessness. Yes, right. So you have a, there are a lot of great ideas in that. And I'm so glad that you raised this, Monica, because I mean, as in disability studies, you know, Leonard Davis and other people say, it's too easy to say we're all disabled, right? And I think sometimes people walk away thinking like, oh, well, and you know, when I say to you, can, I, can an idea of disability collect you? Um, I think sometimes people think that means, okay, well, what that means is that we're all, oh, this is the, the condition of things. And as you say, Monica, it's really important to actually be attentive to the, the very specificities of our uh, experience. So it is actually different, right, for my wheelchair using friends to navigate the street right outside my house, as opposed to someone uh, with two walking legs. It is different uh, for my son, Graham, to navigate the normative pace of the school environment than it is as somebody who's uh, neurotypical. And so it would be cheap and indeed a kind of um, 
uh, nullifying of the politics of the disability rights movement, right? Which after all gathers itself as disabled people, right? And they would, in the United States, in the activist communities, many people, not everyone, like language is a rich and evolving thing, but many people would say, uh, that disability, calling ourselves disabled, helps us to gather, helps us to be visible in a policy environment, helps us to advocate for very real, very material legal mandates for rights, and so on. So that's really important. Um, as you say, there is another tension there too about, uh, you know, um, what's sometimes uh, uh, discussed as the difference between disability and debility. Like there are people who have conditions for which they are seeking cures. There are other people who have conditions such as deafness or blindness who are not interested in cures or interested in adaptation. So you will, <clears throat> you will find people uh, with all kinds of different relationships to um, uh, the medical kind of model of disability, right? That, that is the treatment that they seek, their engagement with healthcare, their wishes for funding and research and so on. It's just, it's just too dimensional and variable to generalize about. Um, and then finally, I mean, I, you know, I think Monica, you were asking about how, how do we talk about disability without it being at this kind of, um, without woundedness, I think was the word that you used or, or diminishment. Do you want to what is your response to anything I've said, or do you want to clarify that? Yeah. And could you say it slowly, yeah. just the, the mic uh, echoing and stuff? Um, yeah, I was asking, how do we how do we talk about disability, I guess, in a way that's uplifting um, yeah. instead of, of helpless yeah. or wounded, um, yeah. while also not kind of removing the, you know, sometimes the drama of, of not fitting in with, with yeah. the world. Yeah, that's right. And I think this is where I think the work of culture um, does its very particular work. So if, if you want to broadcast a different story than a medical one, that's why Alice, for example, is touring all over the place doing wheelchair dance, right? She is not trying to say to you like, don't feel bad for me. I have overcome my body because I can do fancy tricks. Like it's not that it's not that simple, right? She's saying, look at this. A wheelchair is an alternate form of mobility, you know, it, it is actually a kind of, there are closures, you know, and frustrations and barriers in the built environment. There are openings on this stage. Okay, now you're doing what the arts do best, which is estranging you from your ordinary categories, right? You walk around thinking, oh goodness, it must be so hard to use a wheelchair. You see Alice dance and you think, whoa, disability culture, wheelchair dance, it's a whole genre, it's an entire field, like what does this mean, right, about what it means to be in a body that's different than mine, and then all of the stuff that you do that art helps, helps you do, right, in that estrangement, defamiliarization, juxtapositions that you don't expect, all that surprise, it rearranges all the synapses in your brain so that you're thinking, the, the inherited wisdom on this topic I'm having to kind of contend with, and the way that a novel does that same thing for you, and, and the way that all metaphors and symbols do that work for you. Now, if you go to Alice's, you know, performance, then you'll see there all kinds of radical access measures being taken to make that performance itself, you know, described um, uh, orally, you know, um, that, and you'll see in other words, Monica, like she's both making beauty and she's also in the act of doing that performance, pointing out to you all the urgent means of practical access that need to also be in, in the world, right? And and when we were doing that kind of durational visit in Seoul, we were trying to mix those, both the wonder and the beauty of dance with like, let's get on the ground and meet with local activists and see what they're, what they're about, right? That's what I mean about playful and pragmatic. And that's what I mean about expanding your own collection in your mind's eye about what a body of work could do. Some of it could be that expressive beauty, joy, wonder, enigma, grit in the system, friction and criticality. And then some of it can be like, some folks are looking for better gear, right? And here's what I want to say, right, to, to students who are here and, and recent grads. Some of you are asking yourselves, like, well, where is my post in all this? Right? Where do I belong in all this? If, even if it's not disability, it's like, do I want to do the playful and the expressive and the critical, the metaphorical and symbolic, or do I want to plug into product design and very practical tools? And I think, you know, take your own temperature. Some of you are going to be drawn to one or the other. Some of you are trained in the one, but you're really curious about the other, and you're trying to use your time at SVA to migrate in that direction. Great. All good scenarios. But also, I think some of you, maybe like me, are thinking like, I don't want to have to pick. Like, at a certain point, I was just kind of like, you can't make me. You know, like, I, yeah, I was, I was, 
trained in, in the arts and cultural history and I landed in engineering school and I just thought it has to be possible to build a hybrid lab studio. It has to be possible to spend some of your time alongside people doing very workaday tinkering stuff and then also making some artworks to help people think. And that's what I mean about a mixed body of work and practice that you can build over time. But I think, I hope you're hearing today that you should think in abundance rather than scarcity about your time in graduate school and not think in terms of, well, here's a forking path. Like either I make, you know, if, if in my case, either I'm do all wheelchair dancing all the time, or I go to Procter and Gamble and make the oil of Olay, you know, handle. I think like you can, you get to do a number of those things at, in your various kinds of roles. And you can do some for a couple of years and then do some other, but that's what I mean about collecting in your mind's eye, where is all the material culture of disability? Where is all the material culture of, you know, moving a nation on, on climate change? You know, like that also needs the most expressive, poetic, persuasive work. It needs also very practical tools for mediation. If you understand in your mind's eye, the worth and the work of each of those things, it will help you choose and hop and, you know, travel between and among posts. Anyway, that was a long answer, Monica. <laughs> Thank you for asking. That. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Anybody else? Hi, Sarah. My name is Corey. Uh, thank you so much for speaking to us today and for, for sharing this. I read your book last summer as well, um, and it also really resonated with me. And the idea is, of um, the built environment um, really not being made or designed for all these different body types and abilities um, is, is something that has been on my mind for a long time. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, what, what do you see as the biggest obstacles um, to thinking of this differently, designing this differently? And then uh, second part is, is there a roadmap in your mind of how we get to that point? Um, based on your experiences and your successes in these projects, um, like a way of working to, to get to that. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, well, I mean, I think the biggest barrier, you know, if you look at the inherited structures of the built environment now, or the cities that we live in, the preponderance of stairs, the lack of ramps but also elevators and automatic doors and so on a lot of those are inherited structures that presume uh an able-bodied typical kind of youngish working man <laughs> not in the company of a toddler not in the company of an older adult not on crutches and not carrying heavy things in other words an unencumbered kind of idealized usually male self and so you can see that, right, in, in the built environment. You can also see the beautiful practice of retrofitting adaptation uh, and sort of acupunctural kind of moves to, to modify the built environment so that you address what I think is the biggest barrier, Corey, which is not designing uh, with an idea of, two, of at least two-ness, a kind of interdependent body. That is, that, that's what I mean about a future with help in it. The, the cities that we inherited don't imagine exchanges and forms of assistance. But if you look, you can find those creative retrofits everywhere. We're not gonna get carte blanche and get to start over. So if you look at you know, the, the kind of disability led uh, innovation of the kneeling bus, right? That is a kind of invention of the 1970s, a really beautiful way of kneeling the right front corner of a bus down to get a, a wheelchair, um, uh, you know, mounted and inside, but like I've been told, you know, anecdotally that the, the women's center, which is kind of the feminist organized group here in Cambridge, lobbied the city of Cambridge in the seventies to make it policy that the bus driver would also kneel the bus for parents using strollers. So that's a moment, right? Where people newly awake to conditions of assistance and dependence are, <clears throat> are like, okay, well, what's the, what's the kind of retrofit, right? Whereby you take the inherited city and you, you uh, for one thing, invent the kneeling bus, for another, create the policy whereby the kneeling happens for more than one kind of assistance. And then what does that do for, to kind of open your, your mind's eye for other sort of forms of, you know, slow streets. And uh, there's a project called the Stopgap Project in, in uh, Toronto. I did an event with this guy, Luke Anderson, who started it, who's a wheelchair user when I was in the early stages of slope intercept, 
um, we got in touch because he he runs a whole retrofitting DIY single step ramps um, that are distributed all over Toronto. And the and the really cool thing is stopgap.ca for, for Canada. The really cool thing is that though the aesthetics of that ramp are, they're all brightly colored, they're all like primary colors, they all have a little rope handle on the side, and they all say stopgap CA in that kind of stencil typeface. So do you see the, the aesthetic of that is like the city under construction? Like it's just broadcasting to you that inherited conditions are not the way things have to be. And, and so you can see on stopgap, like the the plans for like downloading and building your own, but also this kind of like real groundswell of support for like, what if the, all the sit, what if all the, you know, shops in an, an entire block or a business district committed to getting these brightly colored ramps? Like, just think of how, what that does in your mind's eye to say, oh yes, the inherited city presumed, right? That nobody in a wheelchair would ever be a, a paying customer, but it, it turns out here they are. And I just love that stopgap has not tried to make smooth, like smooth away that assistance, right? They've, they've just been like, no, no, call attention to this and do it in the stencil typeface. I just think that is like genius. And then, you know, it's like, I think a lot about the structures of time in cities. I wrote a, a, an op-ed this past summer about the way that in the pandemic, the this big thoroughfare that is right out in front of my apartment building has been closed to cars on Sundays for, decades, thanks to an ordinary citizen who lobbied for it. But in, in the pandemic, because we needed more outdoor space in a dense city, we got Saturdays and Sundays closed to traffic. So there was no material intervention except for the appearance of gates and signage right at two ends of this thoroughfare. But it, but the time, declaring the time on Saturday and on Sunday. And if you could see like the older folks walking really slowly with, you know, companions and, and uh, with canes. If you could see the little bitty toddlers learning to bike, they need that wide berth. They need like modes of assistance. So there, Corey, is a way that it's like, think outside of infrastructure, overhauls, carte blanche, you know, utopian schemes and think, what do we have? Okay, what's the retrofit? Sometimes it's low tech, sometimes it's high tech. What are the structures of time that could declare and just make flexible and give oxygen to cities with that kind of inherited structure. So I think the biggest barriers are assume modes of assistance, assume modes of assistance at every exchange in the city, right? Assume always that if you like, like that if you're trying to get somebody to their workplace or to the voting booth, assume, right? That like me, sometimes they will have a double stroller and a baby strapped to their chest. Okay, so like, how are they gonna do it? <laughs> you know, like where can you plant like the sort of normalizing of, of modes of assistance? Um, and then think outside of, uh, of, you know, literal buildings and curb cuts and so on. And think about this fourth dimension of time, modes of exchange, think about, you know, seniors only and immunocompromised shopping hours. Think about like all that making room. It was so interesting to watch all that. So I hope that helps a little bit. It does, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Sarah, thank you for your share. It's really inspired. Uh, my name is Kathy. I'm the first year student in the program. Um, I used to design for healthcare industry when I worked in the design consultancy. And during that time, I observed that some of the patient or disabled people, they, they don't want to be treated as a, a lower person. But as a designer, we will say, oh, no, we are here to observe your problem. We, are, we will design a cool solution for you to like make a better life. So what do you think in this way? Like, How can we really be humble and really respect when we still design for this kind of disabled people? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Thank you for the candor, Kathy, because I think that that exchange just happens all the time, right? And I think that my own engineering students are conditioned to think in that way too. And with the best intentions, they say, right? Like I'm gonna to go to the situation where somebody has a need and I have some tools, right? And as you say, it can go really wrong because of the, the kind of paternalism and the one directional way that we assume that we know something about people's lives. And we assume that if their body, you know, has has needs for assistance, that it must be a diminished form of living. Again, it's a, it's a, a failure of imagination really about resources, adaptability, and so on. So I would say to you, you know, there's a kind of, there are good frameworks in um, like community development work where you take apart uh, a kind of deficit model, mental model in your mind's eye, where you're thinking that's that kind of problem solving and wicked problems thing where you think, 
what are the deficits here? Well, that must be the only place that could design could drop in. And instead of just a deficit model, you might add, you know, to your mental model, an assets based uh, framework for thinking about people in their lives. So in other words, if you're going to show up to do the ethnographic interview, you want to ask somebody how they move through their kitchen, how they, you know, get into and out of a car. What is it that they care about? What are the social, uh, you know, uh, priorities for them? What kinds of gatherings do they go to? What do they do for fun and for leisure? What are they trying to get done in terms of like meeting with their bridge club every week or whatever? Like, in other words, ask people what it is that they do in their lives every day. What are their joys? What are their pleasures? What are their wishes? And then yes, add to that, you know, uh, what's your, you know, in, in ethnographic design, we would ask superlative questions, you know, like what's your best day, you know, um, in, in a kind of cooking environment and or what's the worst day? What's the most surprising thing that happened? All of that rich storytelling does that work of humility, Kathy? I think because it, it presumes again, that anybody in any embodiment is having a richly dimensional life, full stop no matter what their capacities are. And so you're coming in to say, I understand that you are a three-dimensional human being. Tell me about that. What is it that you want to do? What are you trying to get done? And sometimes I find that people don't always see those assets as such, you know, like we're, we're all kind of um, moving around the world and kind of adapting and, and work arounding and hacking our way through. And a lot of times people don't see that resourcefulness for what it is. So one thing designers can add to by being close observers in that ethnographic sense, we can say, oh my goodness, how interesting that you, not like in this, like, you're so amazing, you know, like, but just how interesting that you, like my friend Chris, right, trying to change the baby's diaper. How interesting that you rigged up this little, this little thing. Show me again how you, I've just sat with him and watched as he cuts an avocado, you know, with one hand, like for a two handed person, it is hard to believe. But if you if you're attentively watching, you say, it's both the most ordinary, it's the most ordinary and the most extraordinary thing in the world, which is just a body adapting in any of its forms. So you go tell me, how do you do the onion? How do you keep it stable? Oh, that's interesting. What do you do about frying an egg? And you're just asking because you want to know, but you assume that somebody is doing as much that's really quite adaptive and resourceful as it is that they're meeting barriers and hurdles and right and and so you just don't know where design might drop in. And you can design some of the time for people's wishes, preferences for beauty again, and not just for not just assuming that like everybody's just trying to get by and do the most medically determined need thing, you know. Thank you so much. Yes, deficits and assets, yeah. Hey, Sarah. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I have commented before just on the precision and eloquence of your writing. It's really, really extraordinary for those who haven't read your book. Um, and it's just such a pleasure to listen to you. And my question is about uh, language. My question to you is about language because something occurred to me as you were talking this use of like dichotomy and paradox so you know turning wicked problems into fortified questions giving and receiving scarcity and abundance uh, you talked about etzio's cosmopolitan localism um cardboard carpentry i mean even the central metaphor of the talk around the mind's eye is putting two things together that may not be together or are actually seemingly antithetical and, and, and creating like a new muscle out of the combination of them. Um, so uh, even with the symbol, the uh, handicap symbol that I think you didn't include in your presentation, but we can send um, a link out to the case study that's such an incredible example of sort of before and after. Um, when you talked about physics, you use the terms acceleration and resistance in a very physics way, but it, it occurred to me that maybe that is like, you, that's what you're doing, is negotiating between those two things mm -hmm. at a greater scale. So I had kind of a personal question, which is, in terms of your accelerant and your resistance, um, what you are trying to work with now, uh, and then maybe under and on top of that is, if you could comment a little bit about the importance of language uh, in perhaps this flavor of design. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, that is so generous. And uh, 
so attentively read. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's so, I've never thought of that before that acceleration and resistance, I mean, which is about the extent of my knowledge of physics. I mean, to me, it's still just like, M magical, you know, invisible forces, but I think in a way that's kind of the outsider's privilege, right? Sort of knowing less about the actual mechanics and, and being really dialed into the wonder. But you are right, I think, of course, that there's the, the, the twinning of and, and, and paradoxing is the thing that draws me. Um, and moreover, I feel really, uh, I feel quite fortunate to be uh motivated by an alloy of acceleration and resistance and just to be really concrete what i mean is you know i so i became the mother of a child you know who who just like lit up all my days but who also was the you know just sort of on the receiving end of all this weight of history and the way that people would speak about him and the way that they were mapping out his life and the way that they treated me also as his parent and the conundrum of Down syndrome in kind of genetic engineering. I mean, there's it, like the freight of that was a lot at the same time that our life was just opening up with all this joy and discovery. And I could hardly put those two things together. And then fast forward to kind of like meeting blind people and deaf people and people using wheelchairs, people like Alice, who showed me such openings in human experience, like all this discovery and wonder at the same time, this is what I mean by the alloy, alloyed powerfully to the resistance that is, you know, kind of the, the long wait for good proper health care, the kind of, you know, sheer inertia of a kind of economic notion of personhood and worth that militates against disability the, you know, watching, watching Graham kind of navigate through the expectations for school and to be constantly measuring how, how normal-ish is he, right? And the, and the kind of congratulation about that with no sense of like, how might we value the, the human full stop? So like that kind of like, like anger and wonder, you know, resistance and acceleration, like that, that is a powerful alloy, you know, and I, I do feel I do feel fortunate that I think every day I wake up and think, is this matter still urgent? It is. Is it also the most creative opening for research I've ever witnessed? It is both those things. That's what you mean, isn't it, Alan? By acceleration and resistance, like the, the, the difficulty and the freedom that like the, the, the barrier and the joy. And then I'll talk about language, but I just want to hear if that's what you mean. Um, it is. Thank you. Like extraordinary candor um, in that response. Thank you, Sarah. I also wanted just to shout out. Um, it's, it's amazing when we meet our students' parents, but I'm not sure we've ever met a speaker's yeah. parents. Yeah, I know they're here. Audie so Hendren, Mike and Gotti. Really, really honor your 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 participation here. Thank you so much. You might even have a question. I don't know. <laughs> When are you coming on in the April break? And you know, like we'll we'll, we'll deal, do our housekeeping. Um, yes, I'm really happy to have my parents here. I'm very lucky that they're my parents. So um, yeah, and just about language, Alan. I mean, I would say, you know, as somebody trained in culture and the forms of culture, that is to say, history, uh, you know, painting, a love for poetry and poetics. I feel like a big part of my work outside of disability has just been about trying to um, make a case always that the language that we use, the images of the world that we uh, employ are working on us all the time. And that and it, is our, it is the dignity of consciousness to keep seeking new language for old ideas, to keep defamiliarizing ourselves from the kind of uh, just the lizard brain inertia that we all kind of resort to. I mean, we just do. And, and so to me, it is quite uh, exhilarating and difficult and fun and all, you know, all together to keep saying, what's another way to say this? How can I say this in a way that you will believe me? You know, how can I say this in a way that you will, that I will, and we will wake up, you know, wake up to the wonder that is this, uh, this strange thing about being a body in the world, you know, and being it being frail and it also being 
adaptive, the ordinary and the extraordinary, and just insisting on that all the time. It's very hard to pin it down. So you have to be looking at all forms of language to do that. And maybe I especially care about that because I'm in an engineering context and engineers often think like, well, I have the tool, right? And I think I'm over here with some words, you know, but I, but I, you know, at the end of the day, I think about the words, other people's words that have just changed my life, you know, that have given me the kind of that waking up that I needed, you know, so I continue to, to, to feel like culture matters, I guess. Thank you. Can I speak here to that person? Yeah. Uh, hi, Yukti. I think you can go ahead and ask your question. If, um, yeah. Uh, hi. So um, I, I always feel like when you um, design for the disabled, uh, you actually kind of make the design better for everybody. And like you said, how the kneeling bus um, you know, even a cycler, like a cyclist can get on the bus easily after that. And it's good for even the older adults. The same goes for like the OXO products, which uh, make arthritis products. And um, it actually helped everybody peel things better in all of the other range of products that they make. But I was curious as like, we as designers are still empathizing about these topics, but a lot of times uh, there's a lot of lobbying required to be able to bring these products to life. Um, so I was wondering how, um, and a lot of times when we are in like a real world scenario, it's the designer's job to like kind of convince the people in business that this would, this is, they have to see it beyond the uh, price that it would take to build something like this for the disabled. But uh, like, how can how can we as designers influence policy and people convince the people in business to go ahead and make a product that um, is going to be better for the disabled? And also, how do we make a case that it will be good for everybody in general? Yeah, Yukti, I mean, this is a very, uh this is a, a kind of enduring tension, I think, um, you know, I, I talked to one of the designers that worked on the OXO Good Grips and he said like, look, you know, it's not as though the world is full of cases like this where the end point would be the, you know, the, a product that arrives for under 10 bucks at, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond, right? Like that case, and you do want, that is a kind of idealized universal design case where the, the, the morphology of the thing conforms to, you know, an economics of scale, you know, with a, with a household price point, you know, so, but it seems to me, so, so that's a really interesting story. We should celebrate it, be really happy about it, but it's also not, it, it just can't be the only story, not, not only because, you know, universal design has this kind of like, let's make the business case. And mm. that, that, like, we should always be suspicious of the win-win. <laughs> I mean, when it's trotted out as this kind of like, see, like no one ever has to make a concession, right? To their personal liberty. No one ever has to go out of their way and spend money, right? No, they do, right? That, that is what politics, the realm of politics is for. And this is what you're asking you to. So how do designers, you know, get in there? I think, again, you know, when you look at the Adaptive Design Association and they're in the garment district in New York, people see that process, that, that kind of mode of manufacture. And they think like, well, this is such a heartwarming, rewarding practice, you know, and it's like a whole world of special education. So it's like a woman run shop. And so people are like, how, you know, again, like how moving and whatever. And I think like, no, that there is real signal there that not all modes of manufacturing need to conform to that OXO Good Grips universal thing right now you're going to get naysayers you people people go by adaptive design all the time and they go i've got one question for you as though they've never heard this before does it scale right like that that's what they want to know you know as though that's your trump card and like if and if it doesn't do that in that 19th century factory form our, this conversation is over right so i think you it's like can you can you make a case for uh, a business that doesn't have endless exponential growth as its horizon, I think you should be able to do that, right? Look at Zubits, look at magnetic closures for, um, you know, you can, the whole adaptive fashion world is that, right? It is these kind of medium scale businesses. Could you at a policy level, you know, um, ask for more, you know, uh, seed funding for that kind of thing? Actually, there is this really, the, the uh, developmental disability 
advocacy group here in Massachusetts runs with the, what they call Arc Tank. It's because their acronym is ARC, so it's like Shark Tank, but it's Arc Tank, which is the um, you make a case for a small scale business and you get some influx of cash, right? You pitch a you pitch an assistive technology business, and so lots of people are doing those kinds of things. I think it is just you have to keep saying, and and then you know it's like as designers in your own path. Do you end up in a, you know, in the mayor's planning office and you're you're thinking about design in a civic sense, right? You get to make those choices too, that you land in a place where uh, quarterly earnings are not the only measure for impact. But I also just think, you know, when I speak to people who want the business case, I try to both point to uh, distributed manufacturing, digital fabric digital fabrication, mass customization, that's already in the market. There are lots of post 19th century uh, industrial models that we could point to, but also to try to keep knocking at exponential growth as the only measure of success. Now, you all may have to invent that future is, is, is a bottom line. You know, like you may have to say, we're going to insist, right, that there are, uh, whether you call it social enterprise or, you know, uh, just kind of me medium scale uh, businesses, but there are, there are markets for these you know, semi-universal objects. There are customizable objects. There are platforms for working in diffuse design. It's out there. Yeah, thank you. thank you. I feel like we can always question them, like what difference you're making in this world through this and make right. them think about it too. Okay. Right, I mean, and, that, and the, the guy that did the OXO thing, I mean, he said to me like, Sarah, we see things that we could fix and we mm -hmm. don't because we know we can't arrive at, right? But they're working under a kind of constraint that again is inherited. But I, I don't think this is too just academic and ivory tower to just say, there, yeah. there, you don't have to just accept, uh, given again, the sheer technology and the, and the network forms of, of uh, economics now, you don't have to accept that trump card of scalability. But it, it, in his world, and OXO and SMART, that, that combination, they've done a lot of great things. You know, They've revolutionized a lot of, but anyway, just, you know, keep at it. <laughs> My dad is holding up something to the screen. Nine, dad. <laughs> Sorry, here, family. Got a family gathering here, dad. Let's talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we had a nice uh, little dog cameo in the back that I'm not sure you noticed while you were speaking. No, I, no, I do. It's like Zoom life, you know, like, yeah. yeah. You, it, and it wasn't a little dog. That's the point, right? It's a giant yeah, yeah. dog. <laughs> it was quite, it was a quite majestic visit. <laughs> yeah, um, right. I think we have one, one more question from Erica. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. Uh, my name is Erica. Whoa. Um, thank you for such a beautiful talk. Um, I, too, read your book last summer and was just taken by the chapters, all the chapters and various angles you took with what the body can do. Um, and today, particularly, I love that you know you included Alice, because um, I'm also a professional dancer and I myself have had experience dancing for moving with uh, performers with wheelchair. Um, I did contact and talk with them and the ex I was taken back to that experience of just like what that was like experiencing them moving with the wheelchair as an extension of their body um, in the studio space and kind of navigating weight transfer with that extension of the body is really quite magnificent and um, yeah. hard to navigate with in real time during an improvisation. Um, so I can imagine what that's like and it's it's so incredible. Um, my ask is a little bit more on, I guess, the really if, if you're willing to share a little bit more about the process of designing objects for the body and where kind of the role of the mind comes into play, where um, the mind and body connection, how much are you trusting the articulation of what goes on in someone's mind versus what the body is actually telling you through observation. Um, you talked about the mind's eye, where the role of, you know, if someone who has aphantasia and is unable to kind of imagine 
when they close their eyes, imagine different parts of your bodies and imagine what's happening in your bodies and how they talk about that. And I have friends with agentation and who are also dancers. And so talking about sensations in the body is so different with them as well. So I'm just curious a little bit more about that process of designing the objects for the body and you know, advice you would give to a designer like myself who might be, you know, designing objects that would kind of fit in the crevices of the body and how that might look like. Thank you. Yes. Well, I mean, I think so feel free to follow up if this is sort of a field of what you're looking for. But you know, I think in the same way that we want to impute um, you know, a full three-dimensional life and embodiment to somebody with a disability, the same as somebody who doesn't appear to, to have a disability. In the same way that we would give that all that dimensionality, right? Wishes, hopes, dreams, assets, and challenges, all those things. I think the same principle applies whenever we're doing human-centered design. And that is this, we are in that sponge way taking in, yes, what people say. So what people are reporting from their own mind about this is what I want, this is what I'm trying to get done. This is what this is my experience of my experience, right? They are reporting from that subjectivity. As a designer, paying attention, you're going to take all that down. But you're not just going to be doing that. And this is again, you're, this is for anybody in any design research situation. You're also going to be observing, you know, uh, silently taking in what's actually happening in the interaction, perhaps observing interactions with other people. In other words, when I teach my students human-centered design practice, all of us, right, know something for sure about ourselves. There's also a lot about ourselves that is invisible to us by definition. So we need actually designer observers to reflect back to us. I'm noticing that this is happening, or can you tell me about what you just did here and there? In other words, we all of us have facets of our experience that are that are not available kind of to us. We need that dialogical kind of interaction to understand. So I think... That is how you, you start. So, and, and remember, right, you're doing all that ethnographic research, data, 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 self reported, observational stuff in the room, interactions. Then, when you kind of download that in sticky form or digitally, you're, you're like, okay, massive data, synthesize what are the themes, what are the pattern recognition that I noticed, you know, what are the kind of big, uh, uh, you know, descriptive um, affinities that, you know, all that mapping that you do. All of that, you're trying to say both, what did I see? What did they tell me? And then uh, my husband's a film editor and he often says, what's the note behind the note? In other words, what's the data behind the data? When somebody's telling me uh, a lengthy story about uh, uh, navigating one-handed through their kitchen, they're telling me about their sequence of knives, but really they spent 40 minutes talking about how uh, how often they gather with their extended family. So the knives are not really the note. The note behind the note is like, it's really important to them to have those family gatherings, okay? So maybe the knife is not the thing. They are self-reporting that the knife is the thing. But what I heard, because my antenna are wide, I'm doing my design research, is that family gatherings symbolically mean the world to them, okay? So we may not be doing the knife, right? We may be doing something else. And then you go to people, that's the whole process of prototyping and testing and saying, we were hearing, right? That family was really important to you. So does that make sense? Like where it's just a regular old human centered design process where people know some things really for sure about themselves and then lots of stuff they don't know. And that's what that's where designers do their good work. We're not doing customer service here, right? We're not showing up to take orders. We are, we are showing up to say, what is in the room, right? And where can design then drop in? But do you want to follow up on that? Yeah, that was that was awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think that's our last question. Um, thanks so much to everyone for your great questions. And Sarah, that was incredible. Thank you so much for your time. Thank um, you. Pleasure. Yeah, I can't wait to, to read your book. Thank you. Very well, I hope we'll meet in person before too long. Take care, everybody. Thank you.